pool right there. I said there's a pool right there. Church is messy and it's supposed to be. Because of the people that make up the body of Christ, which are full of hypocrites, liars, backstabbers, thieves, all sort of lust and so forth, because that's who God has chosen to make up the body. Because if he didn't use those, there would be nobody because that's, that's who we are. We are vile people with a lot of nasty idiosyncrasies, some sinful things that we still have not yet gotten out. And because of that, there is going to be a lot of, since there's mess in us, there's going to be mess in the body that needs to be brought out. And it takes people in the body to deal with the body. That's why Paul makes a statement in Galatians 2. Speaking to Peter and about Peter, the Bible says that he opposed him to his face. Why? He says, because for prior to coming to certain men uh, from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the part of the circumcision. In other words, fearing the Jews, he says, the rest of the Jews joined him in his, his hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. And so the reason why you confront people, the reason why you expose folks, the reason why you do this is not to hurt the person. It is because there are other people that will follow suit who may not know any better. And the sad part is we've got preachers who do that. And some of the preachers can be very well intended, very well meaning, but some of them may not be. His name is in me, not on me. Like I said, like in me. Do you understand it? Angels recognize who I am. Devils recognize. Hear the voice of God. I stare the waters. Fire of the Holy Ghost. And I thank God that now I'm here. Who was the biggest loser? Satan? No. God. Out of life. Come all the way off of her. Jude tells us in Jude 3, he says, Beloved, while I was making my earnest effort, eagerly wanting to write you about your or our common salvation, I want to talk about how good our salvation is, the Lord is. What I did do, I felt it necessary or I felt the necessity to write you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Why would Jude say such a thing? Why would we just skip over or, you know what, let's put on the back burner our love for the Lord and our salvation, which that's not a back burner issue, it's not a secondary issue, but there's something that's pressing. He says the reason why for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Well, how do you creep in unnoticed? Well, you have to look like you belong. You have to, in some cases, speak like you belong. You, you, everything about you seems like you belong. And so what, and matter of fact, you may very well belong, but the point is we have to contend for the faith. The faith is the more important thing, the tenets of the faith. And you've got people nowadays who are going to want to vilify the scriptures and tell us that we ought not look at certain things. As a matter of fact, we should study the Bible and we might want to move away from the Bible. That's why the idea of theology or the study of God is so asinine and sophomoric to me. The pride to think that God would sit in your Petri dish to be observed by you. Said that the Bible is the authority. The Bible says the Bible teaches the word of God. Because of that language, consequently, most Christians, most thoughtful Christians, believe what's in the Bible. Are you ready for this? Because it's in the Bible. And you have to help them change that. Now, some people get mad because you point out their errors. But look, Paul makes a statement. I think this is a, a, a very worthwhile statement. He says, he says, so have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? Well, we're going to say some things to someone who they may not agree with. There are some things that I've said things that folks don't agree with and they were offended. Well, I'm not, trust me, I'm not saying anything about you or what you're saying because I have an issue with you. If I've ever said anything to anyone calling something out or exposing something and you were offended, I apologize that you were offended. I apologize if maybe how I said it was maybe wrong, was maybe not compassionate, maybe, maybe a bit insensitive. It's not my point, not my intent. My intent is to contend for the faith, to defend the faith. Why? Because it's bigger than you or me. It's bigger than any of us. It's important because there's some people coming along who are going to listen to certain things and follow certain things. And if we can't talk as a body, if we can't be brothers and sisters and have a conversation, well, that's a problem. Which is, let me tell you something. Third eye doesn't come because you're a Christian or because you're a witch. Every human being is born with a third eye. 
People can say things like that and not want to be held to account, but that's just not godly. That's not right. And it hurts people because it causes people to think of the scriptures in an incorrect fashion. And then you got folks who just want to put on a show. They, they're, they're all about making a scene or a spectacle. for it. I'm actually going to build my stamina. I'm actually going to do something. Syrup all over the communion. Don't care so much. Over the Bible, too. Go back to kick. We're going to get some emails. Here we go. <laughs> so whether it's getting tackled by some woman on stage, whether it's jumping on trampoline, pouring syrup on the Bible, or if it's kicking a football, there's no regard for holiness. There's no regard for the sanctity of the sanctuary. Not that the building is so holy, but it's the fact that you have this gathering amongst the saints. Why? To give their devotion uh, for corporate prayer, corporate fellowship in honor of who? To Christ, to the Lord. And we are to approach him in a holy fashion. But some people have a huge problem with it. As a matter of fact, some people have a bigger problem with us calling out the foolishness. But if you don't call off the foolishness, then you might be the person that's in sin. Paul says, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But now what's happening, the things that are being done in secret or thought about or spoken of in secret, they're making their way out to be boldly stated in public, to be boldly acted out in public. These people's inner inhibitions are coming out on stage things they talk about, things they do, even vulgar things, things that just, let me just let me just throw a little bit of a sexual innuendo out there. You all know what I'm talking about, and it's okay because we're all adults here. Give that man some pasta. Give that man some peace. And I'll let y'all fill in the other pee. Somebody should have ran around the church. I'm just playing. That was playing. The three peas. And you know what that woman needs? She needs dedication. Yes some dollars and i'm gonna let y'all figure out the other d well you can only say something like that because you have given the, the the feeling by people or because no one has held you accountable to think that you're more than what you really are again we're not contending for each other the bible doesn't say contend for each other we are continuing for our faith this faith that is given to us by our father and so we should make sure that no one including other christians make a mockery of that that's why paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, he's speaking about this man who is sleeping with his father's wife. And this can apply to us as well in our own local churches. He says, for, for I, on my part, thought absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved on that day. Paul says, kick him out, put his behind out, get rid of him, put him out. Why? Not because we want to destroy him, but turn him, his flesh over for destruction in hopes that his soul, his spiritual life might be saved on or by or in the day of the Lord. He says, you guys are boasting because you think that hey, I'm not being too judgmental. We're, we live and let live, let the Lord deal with them. Paul says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole dough clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump so the problem is we let this stuff go on because we don't want anyone to think that we're judgmental we don't want and probably maybe the biggest reason why we have that is because we have people that do not love the scriptures do not hold tight to the scriptures don't value the word of god because they don't value god so much so that anybody who just has any sort of fanciful feeling can decide that you know what i want to be a pastor even though i'm not qualified either by gender or my understanding, or my actions, or my lifestyle, or my heart. I'm not qualified, but eh, what the heck? Why not? Yeah, I'm curious to start a church with my partner. Just, I mean, it ain't no big traditional churchy church mess. But I'm sick and tired of church people with all this judgment and all this crap. I'm sick and tired of it. Like, it's, I'm over it. I don't want no holier than thou's at no church that I'm a part of. Amen. Keep your holier than thou ass at home. And not just someone like her. We've got folks that just feel like that they deserve some sort of adoration. They feel entitled. Why? Because people have become 
heaping praises upon them. And so they feel good about it. And when they feel good about it, they start acting like they get this little God complex, uh, this little king complex or queen complex. I love you so much, Mama. It is such an honor to serve you. I honor you as your spiritual daughter. I love you and you're my favorite. You're my favorite person. You are everything to me. You're my spiritual mom. You're my David. <laughs> because they have this complex to where no one can tell them anything, they end up saying any and everything. I mean, things that are just clearly ungodly. They make it up as they go, and still, no one holds them to account. God cursed the earth because of Adam's mess up. But the devil messed up when he got the woman to be deceived. And God said, because you've done that, snake, I'm going to put enmity in between her and you, her seed, and your seed. So when Dr. Owens get up and preach the way she preached, amen, she get upset. Because she has what the man don't have. It's called enmity. So God put enmity between the woman and Satan. That's no, you're missing the point, sir. But again, no one holds them account because they don't read the scriptures. Do this, do this, reign, subdue all of the things God told Adam to do. Do you know the greatest problem with that? You know the most powerful issue with that? Do you know the most profound challenge with that Adam did not have a body and Adam didn't have a body how silly is that that you are more than the mistakes that you have made that the great I am lives in you and whatever he is you are too and then of course whatever God is you are because after all we're just like God we're little gods as a matter of fact this is the stuff that we are called to contend for and the fact is, guys, this is going to be messy. I can love you. You can love me. You can call me out if I say something wrong. It can be messy. I can feel bothered by it. But if it's right, it's right. Again, we should be, the church should be, the body should be big enough and godly enough, humble enough to be able to take what someone says if we see it is incorrect, if it's wrong. Paul says, we should preach the word, be ready in season. Matter of fact, let's go to this passage. Look at what he says. And let's just follow this as our guideline. He says, be ready in season, 2 Timothy 4, 2, and out of season. That means all of the time. He says, reprove. That means to prove someone wrong if that's the case. Rebuke. That means if they are wrong and they don't want to get right, you correct them. Even if it bothers them, exhort. That means to encourage them. How do you do all those things? With great patience and instruction all the time, constantly, and do so why? How? With instructions, using the scriptures. That necessarily means, guys, that it has to be or it has to involve reproving, rebuking, and exhorting believers as well. This is not this is not a game, guys. This is this is life, literally life and death. And he says to do so why? Because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We've seen examples of these people not who don't who don't have sound doctrine and they get a large following. And because now some of those folks, not all those folks that, that are following are, are ungodly. Not all those folks that are following and listening are unsaved. As a matter of fact, some of the preachers who might be preaching this stuff, many of them are saved. They just are. How does Mike Todd put it? You can be saved and stupid. Tweet that. You can be saved and stupid. Now, Paul says in doing so to fulfill your ministry, be sober and fulfill your ministry as an evangelist, spreading the gospel. We want people to know the gospel. There's two things we want to do. We want to let folks know the gospel, the true gospel, to reprove, rebuke, exhort. But also, we have to contend for the faith. We've got to call things out. Notice, Paul on his deathbed does say this. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will pay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him for yourself. Why? For he vigorously opposed our message. This is Paul on his deathbed. So there's, there has to be a balance between calling something out, but also spreading the gospel. Let me just say this. If all you ever do is call people out, if all you ever do is expose, if all you ever do is engage in the dirty, messy stuff, then I'm going to submit to you that not that you're not saved, but that you are immature that you are not concerned about the other things, the things that we are most responsible for, which is to preach the gospel. And so if all you could ever do is name what is wrong and that's all you've got to offer, well, then you don't have much to offer. You have a critical spirit, an attitude of criticizing. 
However, let me say this, because we don't talk about this as much as well. If all you ever do is give the gospel and you never warn anyone, you see danger coming and you don't warn your brother, what you are is also equally immature because it shows a lack of love, a lack of love for the person, a lack of not caring. You may yourself not be a believer because if you don't care or love for the other person whom you see danger coming and you don't warn them, could you imagine knowing that there is some sort of terrorist, some uh, vile person, someone waiting around the corner to hurt people, and you see your brother and sister going that direction and you don't say anything about it? What does that say about you? You know the bridge is out and you don't warn people, hey, the bridge is out. You know there's a fire in the building. You get all of your stuff and you leave and you don't tell anyone. What kind of person are you? And so there's got to be a balance. Again, Oftentimes we might try to balance the two and we might not do so artfully. We might say something harshly or too harshly. If I've ever done so, I'm pretty sure I have. I apologize. The goal is to spread the gospel and also to warn even brothers and sisters who might be involved in that. And so, guys, make sure that you have a balance. But also, if someone warns about you or calls you out, accept it. Go back and look and see. And then if you think that you're right, well, then defend it. You cannot be, we cannot be the kind of people that we don't listen to someone who disagrees with us. As a matter of fact, we either vilify that person or we ignore that person and call that person a heresy hunter, a uh, whatever you want to call them. No, if the person has a legitimate concern, remember, you're not the only person that's saved. And if you're saved and they're saved, as Paul says, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? Well, I'm not your enemy. I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of the gospel. I might be wrong myself. And if you don't speak to me, then I'll never know the other side. I'm calling what I see. I could be wrong. And so it's incumbent upon you, whoever you are or me, to explain this is why I believe what I believe. You should have an open door policy, not a public open door policy where we display these things out in public, but at least the ability to discuss with folks why this is. And if you are a preacher, if you are leading a flock, and you can't defend what it is you're preaching, then you shouldn't be preaching it. If you don't have the ability to walk through the scripture and say, this is why this is, and this is why this is not, then you have no reason to be in the stands. If you can't let the text speak for what it says and you want to dress it up, you also have no, no reason to be there because now you're just trying to put your imprint, your personality, and let that be it. If the word doesn't speak for you, then don't you speak for it. And so, yes, church, our church, our body is messy. It's supposed to be. It's a work in progress. As Paul says, we are all filthy, filthy rags before the Lord. And so the cleaning process, oftentimes we, we see a spill. It's the cleaning process that people don't want to get involved. It's easy to make a mess. It takes some time. You got to get down on your knees and get your hands dirty to clean the things up. And so we want to make sure that we present the gospel as well as we possibly can, even with people who we at times might disagree with. And so let's contend for the faith together. Amen.